we've been uh, discussing a lot of Desi Farland. I'd like to say we're joined on the line by a man who knows uh, a lot about him. Uh, played together in the uh, famous Nafina team with alongside uh, several other legends there. Uh, Desi himself, obviously, uh, Sam Connell, Kieran McGinley, uh, and the McNulty brothers, of course. Epic clashes, uh, the Dubs against our man. Uh, this man also worked closely with uh, Desi uh, during their time at the GPA. Enda McNulty, good morning to you. Thanks for having me. Hi, Adrian. How are you doing, Johnny? Not too bad. I mean, Enda's, again, we can only start by asking about the, the election results and what this means for Northern Ireland and what this means for, for the whole lot of us. I mean, everything else is immaterial, really, isn't it? Well, with Brexit results and with, obviously, Boris getting in to play, uh, I suppose it's strange times in Northern Ireland because, to a certain extent, we've been left behind and, and forgotten about. I know a lot of business people in the North are really, really concerned. A lot of people in education are concerned about a lack of clarity on funding and so on for primary schools or secondary schools. So a lot of my family, my friends, are concerned to say the least. Yeah. Um, the talks was about Desi and the, the what are the dubs getting? I'm delighted. I'm absolutely delighted for Desi. I'm delighted for Nafena. I'm delighted for his family. And yes, I'm delighted for the dubs. What are they getting? Well, first of all, they're getting a true leader. They're getting a guy who's a natural team player. You're getting a guy who will do all in his power to get the best out of the players and the best out of, I guess, the next generation of players. You're getting an honest guy. No BS about Desi. You're getting a guy who's also fun. He knows how to balance the real straight talking and the changings with the fun at night and a few bottles of beer. You're getting a guy who's worked his way from being a psychological or a psychiatric nurse, apologies, up to a guy who's now the manager of the dubs. So in terms of inspiring the young Dublin players what they can do in their career, not even their football career, I think they're getting a really strong role model. Yeah. So my experience with Desi would be the first time I ever encountered him was on a football pitch, Dubs against Armagh. I think it was a National League semi-final and we battered each other. Absolutely battered each other. Proper going old to the football. Ball, uh, at every stage, you know, Desi's elbow up into your jaw. Obviously, I was a much cleaner player than Desi. <laughs> uh, so we battered each other. But I'll never forget after the game. Big embrace, a big hug, a handshake, and stood talking to me on the pitch after the game. That's the sort of character Desi always was. Tough, hard, nothing asked in terms of quarters after given, but always would go toe-to-toe -to -toe and forgive immediately after the game. Always so meeting, I think, the dubs that experience a loyal man, a man that will have absolute loyalty of the players, the fans, the, the county board, the clubs, and, of course, the supporters. So a very loyal character they're bringing in to follow on from Jim, who's had an incredible legacy. And I know sometimes I'm, when I'm on off the ball, you guys give me feedback, and sometimes your listeners will give me feedback on Twitter or whatever and say, Enda, you use too many superlatives, and I do use too many superlatives. But obviously the last five years on the gym, it's hard to use superlatives. It's just been an amazing legacy mm. that he's left. The exciting thing is that Dublin now bringing in a very powerful leader who knows Dublin inside out, he knows the players inside out. He knows the club structure inside out. He knows the Dublin jersey inside out. I think his, his book was famously called Tangled Up in Blue. Desi Farrell has been the epitome of Tangled Up in Blue his whole life. Yeah. Yeah. From your perspective, though, and like from the psychological perspective of this job and it's the pitfalls that it entails in terms of the narrative of like success for the last five years, what's his biggest challenge? Well, Johnny, it's, it's funny, even, even over the last one I've been listening to you guys a good bit, I've been traveling all around the world on work in the last uh, maybe six months around the world this year, from places like Puerto Rico to obviously Tokyo. And when, when I get a chance to try to tune into you boys and I hear you talking, Johnny and Adrian, about soccer and rugby and obviously Gaelic games and so on, and I'm, I'm loving the banter uh, and it keeps me, I guess, at home when I'm away. But, but Johnny, since, I guess, the last time I met with you boys, I probably haven't been good enough at articulating what we're doing now for a living. The psychological aspect of what we do is probably now at most 5%. The rest is about leadership. It's about coaching. It's about high performance. It's about building high performance environments. It's about developing the infrastructures to support performance in the world's leading businesses and, of course, in professional sport. So with that perspective, I would say Dublin are getting a really strong man. They're getting a man who understands the psychology, to, to answer your previous point, Johnny, but they're also getting a guy who's a strong coach. They're getting a strong leader. They're getting a guy who technically understands play very well, both offensively and, yes, defensively. They're getting a guy who's strong with younger players, good emotional intelligence. 
knows how to put his arm around a guy and knows how to challenge a guy, whether it's in the change room or whether it's maybe in a one-on-one scenario. And I've seen him in action as the Dublin coach when he was involved with the Dublin Miners. He would have brought us in a few times to help out from a leadership and teamship point of view. So from that, all those perspectives, Johnny, I think Dublin are getting a very strong character. Yeah, a guy that you've obviously worked with, as you said. And uh, any chance that you're going to get involved here at some uh, very early days, obviously, in his uh, trajectory here as Dublin manager? But any chance that you'll get involved at some point? No, I don't. I don't think there's any chance. To be honest, I've, I've far too much on my plate. And maybe in five years' time, when I slow down a little bit, traveling around the world, I'd love to get involved with a team. But at the moment, Adrian have no bandwidth to get involved with a team at home. With uh, probably now another year and a half, very little free time. Can I ask you as well, you mentioned Tokyo and um, your role over there and you've been involved with the RFU over the last number of years. What was your role in Tokyo? So for the last six years I've been involved with Ireland, it's been a hell of a positive journey overall. Uh, obviously what they've won on the pitch has been incredible in terms of the, the Grand Slam highlights. Big lowlights, I can't put any sugar coating on that, but a lot of lowlights uh, at the World Cup, in particular the Japan def- defeat and in particular the New Zealand defeat. What was my role? The same as it has been for the last six years, helping out with the mental prep, uh, being there as a signing board for the leadership group, being there as a signing board for the staff, and of course, uh, in terms of the coaches. So under one heading, probably the mental prep, uh, support with leaders and support with coaches and staff. Yeah, I'm sure the David Nosefora comments over the last couple of weeks haven't been lost on you. Uh, people have missed it. It's to try and summarise here, and there was there was lots of them. Fallout of it obviously has been uh, deep and, and may continue. But David Nosefora, particularly, um, if you don't mind me reading this quote that he gave in relation to the the um, mental approach, I suppose the the psychological approach. He said to be able to manage. Uh, the stress and expectation of performance, I really do believe it's an important area for us to look at and serve us better. He says the whole area of psychology has to be improved as well as health and well-being. If we yes. continue to do well and manage to get ourselves back up to the top again or near the top, we need to be able to manage that better and drive performance better by supporting everyone better. What did you think when you read that when you saw that? Well, first of all, being very transparent, I would have sat down with David a month ago and we had a very strong debrief. I have huge respect for David and Sephora. I've, I've been working very closely with him over the last five years, so a huge respect for David. What did I think when I read that? Well, first of all, I, I discussed it with David for nearly two and a half hours, about four or five weeks ago. So we had a very in-depth conversation. Uh, when David's saying that, I can assure you, he's not pointing the finger at me or he's not pointing the finger at Joe or about the players. He's saying we as a nation, in terms of rugby, need to significantly raise the bar in the mental preparation of the squad. I would agree with that. Mm. I would absolutely agree with that. Now, you might say, but Andrew, why was this not done? Was your rule not to do this? I would have to hold my hands up and say, in retrospect, there's a lot of things I would do differently. If I didn't say that, guys, you'd say, and you're either arrogant or you're insane. And what would, what would you say if you were to pinpoint some of those things? Well, in terms of what we do differently, you'd probably start back with a culture. You start back with a culture of rugby in general. Uh, and say that we need to start when players are 17 or 18 years of age. Yes, their strength and conditioning is imperative, but so too is their mental conditioning. And you'd be glad to know, and I've said it probably loud and clear on Youth Talk, but also in clubs around the country and now in clubs around the world, we're saying that integrate your mental preparation in with all other aspects of prep. It isn't a half an hour prep you do on a, let's say, on a Friday afternoon. So it's something that should be integrated. That's one of the things I would strongly suggest and David is very open to that. And the coaches in the RFU are very open to now. Are you saying that that was something that didn't happen then, Enda? Or didn't happen to the extent that it might have done? No, it, it did happen. So again, I have to go back and command Joe. Joe. Joe was brought in a culture whereby the mental preparation is almost brought in in every single conversation. In, in every team meeting for the last five years, mm. and I've sat I had a lot of them, in every team meeting for the last five years, Joe should have brought up the mental prep first and happy we're doing together that we would have collaborated on. And I assure you that there's no sugar coating on that whatsoever. Now, I can say that mental prep needs to be more vigorous. We need to get much more, let's say, measured in that. We need to now train our coaches around the country on the mental preparation as well as we do on the technical, tactical, physical and even lifestyle. Yeah. He talked about the players and the staff not coping with success. Was that something that you'd sensed that sort of post-2018 that it became increasingly difficult to tackle that idea that we were headed for the world number one team and we weren't coping with it that well? Well, 
I think that we should have responded better when we were number one in the world. When we had beaten every team in the world, when we were absolutely rocking, I think maybe we should have interrogated our thinking a bit more vigorously so that we were prepared for that first England game in the Six Nations and then obviously prepared to build momentum right throughout the year heading towards, obviously, Japan. Now, you'd say that we beat Scotland, so we actually the momentum was excellent that week. The buzz around the squad was excellent. The boys were firing. The staff were firing. Everything was excellent. And then... Obviously, the Japan defeat really was a big body blow, a major body blow, because from a confidence, a morale, and yes, momentum, it was a huge shot. Yeah. What can you, like, what can you say to players like when you're... Because even obviously the England result is one that's pointed to as a major sort of a red flag at that time where we were like, yeah. Jesus, actually, maybe this is not going to go exactly as... As a nation, we were certainly thinking that way. Maybe this isn't going to go exactly as we thought it was. What can you do with players and, and staff at that point? Like, is it almost too late to turn the juggernaut, if I could use that expression, at that stage because it's so close? Or, or, or in the Japan case, actually, during the tournament? Oh, yeah. It, it's absolutely possible to change it. I actually met Quinny a lot over there. Me and Quinny had a lot of chats on Pep's side before training or after training. Or maybe even actually we were chatting in the tunnel before the All Black game, which is a good experience. The All Blacks are coming out of the tunnel, and the Irish players coming out of the tunnel. Had a good chat with Quinny uh, down there. So when we were chatting during this during the World Cup in Tokyo, we were actually talking about that, talking about you know how to turn things around. My whole life I've been part of sports teams and business teams that turn things around very quickly. So yes, you can turn it around. We obviously didn't do it well enough, Adrian. Mm. We obviously didn't do it vigorously enough. Maybe, and Joe has spoke about this over the last number of weeks, maybe after England defeat, maybe we should have really responded and thought, OK, to a certain extent, let's scrap trying to do well in the Six Nations. Let's not put all of our focus, our entire focus, into the World Cup. But I can't, I can't point the fingers at anybody else. Again, I point the finger at myself. He he was, was saying Andy, enough. he was sorry Pardon? sorry Andy, sorry to cut across. He was saying that actually that maybe there was too much of that. Maybe there was too much focus on uh, being hung up at trying to get to a World Cup semi final. Yeah, but my the point there is in terms of maybe giving more players a little bit more game time. For example, Joey was badly injured uh, coming up to the World Cup. Johnny obviously was injured in the World Cup. Jack's game time wasn't as significant. So in terms of getting them more game time during that period, might have impacted the result against Scotland, but it had a huge impact heading towards the World Cup. Mm. Yeah. We, like, as a nation, are we, it feels like we're scarred by this impossible, uh, mission impossible. Well, I wouldn't be scarred. I learned more in 10 weeks in Japan and the previous camp that I have probably in the last 10 years. I wouldn't be scarred. I think we need to learn. That's the big thing. And that's one of the things that used to annoy me about Armada, that rather than being scarred, can we learn from it? And that's one of the things that David and the staff in RFU are trying to do. Trying to learn. Andy Farr is a formidable coach. A formidable coach. I can't emphasize that enough. What's he like he psychologically, not... I suppose, versus Schmidt? Or do they have they any similarities? What's he like psychologically? He's a different style of leadership than Joe, and I'm sure Andy and Joe would both say that. Uh, what's he like psychologically in terms of, do you mean in terms of his understanding of the mental part of the game? Or do you mean what's he like psychologically, personality-wise? Yeah, well, I suppose the former in that he's, you're coming from the car crash of the World Cup. It's uh, kind of like rebuilding from the rubble, um, <laughs> from like a, 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 a nation that was on top of the world and now is in rubble. So he's got a, you know, is he going to be, is he going to grasp that by the, by the, you know, is he going to be kind of ready to bring in new players? But psychologically, can he bring the players up to the level that... Because, as you say, after that Japan game was a body blow, and I don't think the Irish team has gotten over that yet. Yeah, well, I have no doubt in Andy's ability uh, to get players back up. I have no doubt in his courage. Uh, if you look at any of the footage of Andy playing, there's no, no question about his courage. Also, he's very tactically astute. Because when we look at the World Cup, I know that David mentioned, obviously, the mental uh, performance of the team, and I know that was widely spoken about afterwards. You know, it's a whole kaleidoscope of preparation. It's, it's all aspects of prep, not just one aspect. So Andy's overall understanding performance is excellent, and he'd be very strong at empowering the staff around him to get the best out of the, the players that are currently there and the next generation. Some of the big highlights of the World Cup was the performance like Gary Ringrose. From a mental point of view, his performances, guys, were outstanding. So there's some aspects of mental performance was outstanding and the technical tactical performance and the leadership performance was outstanding. Some aspects of the preparation, by the way, were exceptional. I'll give you one vignette into that. The logistics, 
the team cohesion done before the World Cup, the strength of conditioning, uh, the level of work done to make sure we were the recce and everything done in every venue, it was done meticulously for the last two years. So a lot of that actually needs to be kept intact, as we would have discussed that time with David. And there's other aspects, of you, as you guys have alluded to, and as I've alluded to, it needs to be significantly improved. Yeah. Are you, is that yeah, you, uh, your time with the RFU finished, Enda, now? Has that come to the end of that cycle, or are you still involved, do you think? But to be honest, I don't know. I'm having yeah. a meeting this week with the RFU. I don't know, Adrian. I have to say, it's been a, a hell of a journey. Like, for the RFU to bring me in six years ago, under Declan Kidney, I think it was just, oh, sorry, it was Declan's last year, then moving to Joe's first yeah. year. It's been amazing. I'm very thankful to everything the RFU have uh, involved me in. Like, Joe's journey has been awesome in terms of victories, and yes, some big defeats that is hurting us and will hurt us probably forever. It'll hurt Joe forever. Look at the amount of time that man's put into this. It'll hurt people like Rory. I feel for Rory, another Armand man. I really feel for Rory that it'll end it in that way. But thankfully, in Rory's house at home in Armagh, there's a lot of pictures of incredible memories. So my time with Ireland, I don't know whether it'll continue. What I do know is I'll continue to learn. I'll continue to work with the best teams in business and sport in the world. And we'll continue to move forward. Yeah, and it's uh, been a, uh, brilliant with your time as always. Thanks a million. Best of luck over the next few weeks, whatever it holds. Good to talk to you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Cheers, Enda. Enda McNulty on the line there discussing uh, Desi Farrell's appointment uh, with Dublin and his own time uh, with the Ireland uh, team as well.